Well, good morning. It's a brand new week and this is COVID-19 360. And yes, the president addressed us yesterday, updating us on what would be done or what is being done in terms of curbing the pandemic here in Ghana and the need for us to also uh, adhere, continue to adhere to the social um, distancing protocols and everything else that matters. Our numbers keep rising exponentially and the question then remains what can we do to ensure that we reduce the numbers is it really true that we have reached or may have reached our peak so many questions arising uh but well they says that they, well they said that don't spread fear spread calm and so we're here to also give you all the numbers and also help you better understand the situation surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic so again you're welcome to COVID-19 360 my name is Bella Mundi and my name is Anita Ikiokufu. You know, COVID-19 360 is big on your experiences, your views, your thoughts, and also your comments as well. Over the weekend, uh, we've had some huge jumps when it comes to our case count. On Friday, when we came your way with COVID-19 360, our case count was at 3,091. But over the weekend, we've seen more tests being done and our case count increasing to 4,700. What do you think about that? And also people calling for the ban on public gatherings to be lifted as well. Well, it has been extended to the end of May, so you can share your thoughts on that uh, with us on our social media pages. It is TV3 Ghana across all social media networks. Definitely. Interesting. I was having a conversation with a friend and he was also insisting that it was good that the president lifted the lockdown because we cannot uh, copy the Western world because they have a structure, they have a system. It's easy to trace people. I mean, there's a database of who lives where and what, what, the, what job the person does. We have data on how much they even receive, um, you know, per, per year mm -hmm. based on income and all that. So there's a database to track them. We don't have it here. And he cited an example, Nima. Do mm -hmm. we even know who lives next to who? And so if we're we locking down and making sure that we're testing and trying to feed and all that, how are we going to sustain it? And so then it was good that we lifted the lockdown and find other ways of dealing with the pandemic. So he, he commended, you know, the president. And I thought about it and realized, okay, well, he does have a point. But the numbers are still increasing. What are we going to do to reduce it? And that, that's my question. I don't know what that you is, think. That is my but, worry as well, mm. especially on Friday when the update came in that uh, a fish processing factory had recorded some 533 yeah. cases. And these cases came about as a result of one person. Mm -hmm. So the question now is, what has been done about the other factories that are back to normal. See, we have factories that have more than, you know, 5,000 workers working at a time. So what mm -hmm. has been done? Meaning that if an outbreak or one person should get it, we'll be recording more cases. Yeah, the other concern is, so what if maybe whilst working on the product, it may have been infected. It's passed on to maybe the wholesaler, then the retailer, then the so consumer. So the whole chain. So there's a chain. Have they started doing contact tracing? And what could be the worst that could happen? And we have to prepare for it because you never know. 500, <laughs> there are not, like Dr. Bertha says, this is like a, a continuous a infection. Uh, exactly, reproduction of the infection. And so what could be the worst? And we'll be asking those questions later today when Dr. Bertha joins us. We'll also be speaking uh, to a fellow of the Center for Democratic Development. And so he also gave us some answers to that. But let's take a look at what you have for us this morning. Yes, and so... Uh... Our figures keep increasing, you know, over the past uh, a couple of weeks. And we started on Friday, like I mentioned, with 3,091. Around that time, we had done a little over 130,000 tests. But uh, after the ninth address of the president yesterday, he made mention of the fact that the total number of tests conducted now stands at 160,501, with a total number of positive cases at 4,700. The number of recoveries is at 494, with a total number of death standing at 22 initially it was at 18 so four more have been confirmed dead and the total number of active cases is now at 4184 now let me give you a breakdown of how uh, our numbers have increased and also the tests that have been done on sunday the 10th of may 3045 thousand uh, tests were conducted with 160 testing positive and then when we go back to saturday the 9th of may 2255 tests were conducted with 25 uh, coming out as positive and 
Still on Saturday, uh, 22 positive cases. And on Friday, the 8th of May, a total of 5,253 tests were done with 251 positive cases. And so uh, looking at it, you could see that the numbers kept increasing and increasing. And on Thursday, the 7th of May, 14,046 more tests were conducted. And that cleared uh, the backlog from as far as 26th April. And that also contributed to the 533 uh, positives that were from the fish processing factory as well. And the total number of new confirmed cases was at 921, with 533 coming from the fish processing factory. And when we were at 4,012 positive cases, we had 322 recoveries, and deaths stood at 18. 533 of the new cases out of the 921 cases occurred between Wednesday and Thursday at a fish processing factory located in Tema, meaning that 388 of the 921 21 were from the backlog. But this morning, uh, speaking to Evan Zin Kumasi, he was saying that looking at uh, the state of the sample still to be tested in KCCR, there are still some backlogs. So meaning that uh, even as at uh, April 26th, where we thought that we had cleared that backlog from April 26th, we still have more tests and definitely our figures will be going high. And so, uh, Bella, basically, this is how steadily our figures have moved and from 921, initially our highest was at 530, uh, 550. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was the highest that we were the saying highest, that yeah. yes, we've reached our peak. But after that 921 jump, uh, can we still say that we've reached our peak? Well, that is a conversation do, that I, I know. Like, I mean, we are no health professionals to even understand what's going on and how we can even calculate. But yesterday, again, the Ghana Health Service uh, gave us an explanation as to why they think that we may have reached our peak. And we pray that they are right because now they are saying that we're now getting the new infections. And so we're going to get the test results for those as well. And that would explain why they think that we may uh, have reached our peak. That's if we adhere to the social distancing protocols and adhere to the precautionary measures as well. So fingers crossed, hopefully we won't get too many people. I'm scared because of the factory infections and I'm just asking myself how many more people may have come into contact either with the factory workers or the products that they handled. And if that's the case, could there be more infections, uh, community infections happening at the moment? And, and my concern basically is uh, the test were taken somewhere from April 20. So that, that is where the test uh, started, especially yeah. with regards to some 1,300 people from that factory. And so were they isolated? Were they still working? Yeah, that's the thing. I, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, yeah. We, so we pray that they, they figure it out. And we'll keep updating you. I mean, we've just started the brand new weekend. So I'm sure by uh, end of today, moving into the rest of the week, we'll have more updates for you as well. Like I said, we'll be speaking to a pharmacist. He's also a fellow of CDD Ghana. We'll be asking him a few of these questions as well. And remember that our doctors, uh, Dr. Newman Arthur and Dr. Bertha Sewai, you'll be joining us to answer questions as well. So if you have any difficulties understanding what's going on whatsoever, it is that your question may be, send it to us at TV3 Ghana, and we will answer those questions for you. I guess we can move on now to the rest of Africa. Yes. So as of Friday, our case count on the African continent was around 54,000. We had gone past the 50,000 mark and this morning we are at 64,000 and counting so that plus over there should tell you that as every second passes every minute passes more numbers are updated and our recoveries now stands at 22,000 as of Friday it was at 18,000 with that at 2,254 over uh, the weekend it has increased to 2,300 plus now so let's look at countries with the highest uh, numbers and south africa coming in with 9420 that's 10,015 marks tell you that definitely that is the projection by the end of the day or even by the end of this week they should have gone past that 10,000 mark and south africa would definitely be the first country on the african continent to have gone past the 10,000 mark egypt coming in closely with 9,400 so that's a little difference between egypt and south africa and over the past couple of weeks it's been either Egypt being the highest or South Africa, and they keep switching. But Morocco comes 
person with 6,063. That is a little over 300, uh, 3,000 difference between Egypt and Morocco. Algeria, 5,723. Ghana, hmm, <laughs> the fifth position. Initially, Nigeria was at the fifth. Ghana is now the fifth highest country with uh, the number of coronavirus cases on the African continent at 4,700. Nigeria, 4,399. Cameroon, 2,579, and then Guinea with 2,146. Still, Lesotho is ruling as the only country uh, on the African continent with no case. Yes, it's been almost three months since the continent recorded its first case, and Lesotho is still standing strong and hasn't recorded any case so far. Comoros uh, recorded its first case somewhere last weekend. And this morning, uh, our checks, they are at 11 cases. So that should tell you that definitely after more contact tracing, Comoros will be going high. So now let's, let's look at countries with 1,000 plus cases. Senegal, uh, also, I, how, I, I, we're wondering how far with your RDTs because, well, it looks like their, their numbers are quite stable. They are still around the 1,000 mark. Ivory Coast is also around the 1,000 mark. Sudan, Djibouti, Somalia, Tunisia, and Mayotte, 11 countries have less than 50 cases on the African continent. And we're hoping that with the 50 cases, they will be able to manage it and uh, there won't be more spread as well. But talking about Lesotho, I'm still wondering how they're able to do that. Only God knows. <laughs> Only God knows. I mean, I think I saw a conversation on Twitter. Was it this weekend that South African was saying, but we also have our own Lesotho inside South Africa. And so what's this argument about us not uh, carrying an infection to Lesotho and all of that? I really don't know what they're doing right or what they may be doing wrong. That's if they're not testing. Um, so... They're in luck, I guess, and I hope that it stays that way. At least there should be a country that won't record a case, at least, at right? Least. All right, anyway, it's the COVID-19 360. Keep your questions coming in. Let us know what your thoughts are. If you have any challenges at all, our doctors will be here uh, to give you all the feedback that you need. Not sure if we should jump straight to the world. Yes, um, we can. Okay. Okay, and so... Well, well, whilst we're doing that, we'll quickly just... Okay, let's just okay. take a look at the world numbers um, <laughs> okay, as so well. Yes, and so on the world stage, uh, as on Friday, we were somewhere around the um, 3.8 million mark. Uh, sadly, we have gone past it and mm -hmm. we are inching closer to the... Um, okay, well, well, over 4 million, I should say. Okay. Yes, over 4 million. So let me quickly go on to the Johns Hopkins. We'll fix that. We'll okay. fix that. We'll Let's fix just that when take we a back. quick break and we'll be back to give you the world numbers. Welcome back. It's COVID-19 360. We'll be speaking to Evans in Kum in the Ashanti region shortly, but Anita is on standby for the world numbers. Yes, and so like I was mentioning earlier, uh, our global figure was at 3.8 million as of Friday, and this morning we are at 4.1 million. That is 4,118,783. And so let me give you uh, the breakdown as per country by country. The United States coming in first with 1,329,799. As of Friday, they were at 1.2 million. So that should tell you there has been uh, an increase of over 100,000 more. And then Spain coming in with 224,350. That is a difference of 1.1 million between United States and Spain. Russia was somewhere around the seventh highest or eighth uh, on the list. And then over the past couple of days, they've just had such a huge jump. And now they are at the third on the Johns Hopkins website with 221,344. There has been a spike in Russia and Mexico as well, and we're hoping that they're able to find some uh, answers to whatever is causing that as well. The United Kingdom coming in fourth with 220,449. Italy, 219,070 coronavirus cases. France, 177,094. Germany, 171,879. Initially, when we were talking about the global figures, China was leading at some point. But now, uh, China has gone way below the list with uh, Germany, Brazil, Turkey, Iran overtaken China uh, to be counted as some of the countries on the global front with the highest number of coronavirus cases. And so when you go on the Johns Hopkins website, it gives you the list. And as it goes down, the numbers keep decreasing. Now let's 
move on swiftly to the global recovered. That is the number of recovered cases recorded globally. And now it stands at 1,418,656. As the number of coronavirus cases increases, our uh, global recoveries also in is, is increasing steadily. And with 1.4 million recoveries, it's quite encouraging. And we're hoping that it definitely will be inching closer to the 2 million uh, number of recoveries as well. Now, when it comes to the recoveries, United States States comes in first with 216,169 recoveries, Germany with 145,600, and Spain coming in with 136,166 recovered cases, Italy 105,186. And these countries, due to the number of recoveries they are recording, are easing uh, the restrictions, you know, lifting bans on public gatherings, and even some are uh, starting with going back to school as well, but with most of the uh, protocols still being observed. Italy has 92,000. Uh, 105,186 Turkey with 92,691 and then it follows uh, with Iran with 86,143. China has had some of the highest recoveries looking at their case count which was around 84,000 and with 79,000 recoveries that is very impressive. Now let's look at the global debts and our debt toll stands at 282,947 and for some days now, the United States is leading all throughout from highest number of cases to recoveries to debts. And the United States comes in first on the debt uh, chart with 79,528. United Kingdom, 31,930 debts. Italy, 30,560 debts. Spain, 26,621 debts. France with 26,383 deaths. So Brazil also comes in with 11,123. Now quickly, let's look at the projection here. Last week, we were definitely projection, uh, projecting over 4 million. And this week, we're looking at over 5 million. And we've gone past the 4 million mark. And so definitely, uh, if our experts are not wrong, definitely we'll be going past the 5 million mark. Looking at the number of tests that are being done on the continent of Africa and also globally as well. And so Evan Sinkum is standing by and yeah. Bella will be chit-chatting with him with regard to coronavirus cases in Kumase and especially Obuase, which there has been mm. a spike in cases as well, Bella. Definitely. Thank you so much. And so uh, what we know is that Obuase seems to be the epicenter uh, for coronavirus in the Ashanti region. Their cases have increased. And Evans is here to update us on that and also uh, tell us what may be happening in or Boise at the moment as uh, they intend opening what? Or, well, opening a, um, a holding center. So tell us more about the numbers first, Evans, and you're welcome, by the way. Thank you very much, Bella. So uh, Obuase is now leading with 261 cases, positive cases. Uh, Kumase uh, Metro is second with 32. Um, Kwabri East, interestingly, Kwabri East was recording one of the lowest, but now Kwabri East lead third on the radar with 21 mm. and Asoka Municipal has 20. So these are the four um, leading administrative districts in the Ashanti region. So of okay. course, um, Obwasi remains the epicenter, but you are talking about Greater Kumasi, then Kumasi Metro remains the, the epicenter. epicenter. Quick one, yes, I want to know, Obwasi. so um, could you tell us why uh, Obwasi seems to be recording a lot more cases than the other centers? Evans, can you hear us? Hello, Evans. Okay, so he was just giving us a breakdown of the number of cases in the Ashanti region, and he mentioned four um, of those areas that have recorded the highest numbers, Obwasi being number one with 251 cases. And so um, there's supposed to be a holding center being put up in Obwasi at the moment as a result of the high number of cases, and he was just going to update us on that. Today we seem to be unlucky with Evans in the Ashanti region, a bit of a uh, glitch in his network, or maybe ours, I'm not sure. But we hope that we can get him back again on the line so he can tell us more um, about that. And so especially if you find yourself in the Ashanti region, especially around Obuasi, Kumasi, and the other areas, then maybe you should take the precautions and make sure that you are protected. Evans, you're back. 
Okay, we, we yeah. missed out on quite a lot. So I was asking why Obuasi seems to be recording more numbers than the other areas. So tell us about that, and then we can go to the holding center in Obuasi as well. Well, so as I said, people were anticipating this because Obuasi was first to um, have recorded a case in the Ashanti Rain. That was on the 16th day of March mm. uh, when a minor contracted a disease. So that began the count, the counting of cases. Now, um, I am not surprised, even though I'm not uh, uh, one who say a luminary as far as uh, this count is concerned. But hey, like many of us in the Ashanti region, it hasn't come as a surprise because a, a, a particular administrative district that was first to have recorded a case, the anticipation of that, it is likely to spread. Mm. We were surprised, I mean, two weeks ago when we saw Obuasi occupying the fort on the radar. Now it has moved up. I am particularly surprised about Quabri East because Quabri East only last week was um, somewhere at the bottom. But okay. now it has. Okay. That has increased. Oof. Uh, again, we're having to deal with this. I really was looking forward to the information about the holding center in Obuasi. And uh, hopefully, we can still raise him on the line. Like I said, if you have questions as well, let us know because our doctors will be answering them. Now, the information we're getting is that they're converting a facility in Obuasi into a holding center. And there's some, um, you know, I don't know, challenge or whatever it is. Uh, Evans was supposed to have briefed us on that. But that's as a result of the high uh, number of cases in Obuasi. And I guess it's a step in the right direction. And so hopefully we're, we're praying that um, as much as our death rate is low, we'll keep it that way and rather increase our recovery rates because we seem to have um, one of the lowest recovery rates in Africa. Yes. Um, and so that seems to be the problem. And we're wondering why it's taking people so long um, you know, to recover. So hopefully we'll be able to increase that number but, as well. Okay. Well, he's back. So just Evans, quickly, tell us about the, the holding center in Obwasi. Well, so there was this private facility that um, was um, that have been cited at uh, Akapuriso, which is a suburb of Obwasi. So the plan was to convert this facility into a holding center. I mean, considering the increasing number of cases within the Obwasi um, enclave. But residents, they are saying that no, they will not allow that to happen. And for some days now, they have been protesting against the decision by the Municipal Health or COVID Committee in the Obwasi to convert this particular uh, facility into a holding center. Now, the latest is that the, it is likely that the Municipal Health Committee will, will back down this particular decision because of the incessant um, agitation by these residents. Wow, that's quite disappointing to think that we've been uh, talking about educating people so they understand the need, um, you know, for such things to happen in their communities. But if they decide not to Put it there. I mean, is, where's the closest uh, place that they can have a holding center? Have they given you details on that? Okay, I guess we've lost him. And so anyway, uh, we'll leave it there. But again, the issue about people refusing, um, you know, to accept that there could be a holding center in their community. And that's because they're scared. Well, uh, that is rather unfortunate uh, since... Uh, COVID-19 cases were recorded in Ghana. We've had that issue somewhere in Tema okay, as well. Yeah. We, we saw residents of a particular area protesti protesting vehemently that they didn't want you know, any facility in that area mm -hmm. to be used as a holding center or even an isolation center. I think the message still hasn't gone down very well uh, with people thinking that once there's an isolation center in a particular area, it means that everybody in the area will be getting the virus. I yeah. think more education needs to be done that. If there's a facility here being used for isolation, it doesn't mean that you will be getting the virus. Uh, but that's also because I remember just about a week or two ago, I'm not sure where, whether it was in the Upper East or something. So there was an isolation center that had been left. Um, you know, there were people in there. There was no security. And so residents in that particular neighborhood were complaining about it because then they were able to interact with the patients. And they that wondered quite scary. why. Exactly. So that's why I guess that maybe people don't understand um, or won't accept that there will be an isolation center in their community. Well, but if then that again, is the case, then they have every right to protest. Well, not necessarily. I think we just have to do some more education. But in a situation and where have to step uh, up. confirmed coronavirus, um, you know, 
patients are able to move out freely and interact with people in the community, then they should rather be left to I move mean, around if they, if they want to and the not even be put in a facility. I remember the patients even threatened that they didn't want to be there anymore because I, there was no water, nobody was taking care of them and all of that. So um, maybe authorities need to really look into this and again educate. I mean, the MCs and the DCs, they have to step up. And of course, I know the NCC is going to receive some PPEs uh, from government and so this will help them to step up um, and, you know, educate people even a lot more. And so that's the update from Obwase in the Ashanti region. If you find yourself around there or anywhere else, I mean, really, the virus is no respect of persons or neighborhoods. It can attack at any point. So make sure that you're staying safe and washing your hands as often as possible with soap under running water. If you don't have access to water, make sure you carry a sanitizer along so you can always apply it uh, and it will definitely get rid of the viruses. We'll be back. It's still COVID-19, 360. All right, welcome back. It's the COVID-19 360. Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai is joining us on the line, and hopefully we'll get Dr. Newman Arthur, a clinical psychologist, um, to also join us. And so let's go there. Still having a bit of a challenge with our connection today. Uh, we're not sure what the problem is, but we're trying to fix it. And so once it gets back, um, we'll get straight into the conversation. Now today, we'll be asking more about the 533 people who were infected in the fish factory and what could um, you know have led to that now first of all we're also hearing that one person may have infected all these 533 people now looking at the are not explanation is that even possible can one person um, be the one to infect all the 500 or could we have had one person infecting a number of people who also further um, infected other people as well so Dr. Bertha Sewai good morning and welcome Okay, having a bit of a challenge hearing you as well. If you can just uh, respond again. Can oh, really? Hear? Oh, yes, now we can hear you. Yes. Belated Happy Mother's Day, by the me. way. Okay. Yes, we can hear Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Much. Thank so, you. So quickly into our conversation before our connection goes again. So the 533 factory workers that were infected apparently by one person, is that even possible? Can one person infect 500 people at a go? Um. Yes, it depends on if they're all exposed to that patient at the same time. Because there's a super spreader of Chicago who infected 16 people. There's one attorney in New York, a town called New Rochelle, who infected 100 people. Okay. All right. Huh. We're going to have to grapple with this uh, for today's show. And so please bear with us. But indirectly, she's saying, yes, it is possible. I mean, one person infected over 100 people in another country. And so it is equally possible as long as these people got into contact with the infected person, um, you know, at the same time. And so that sort of explains it. But then again, um, what, what, what else can we do? I mean, ha, there's no update on whether they've started contact tracing. So in this case, what can be done? Okay, there she is. Okay, so I was saying that if you consider the fact that, um, I don't know if you heard the part I said about the super spreader in Chicago, the New York attorney who infected 100 people in New Rochelle, and the one woman in a South Korean church who infected 1,100 people, then it's very, very possible if they're all within the range of that individual. However, the only caveat you have to remember is that it takes, there's a five to 14 day incubation period. So the people the um, patient zero has infected may not spread it immediately. However, if the person keeps going to work every day and infecting new people, theoretically one person can infect those 533. In addition, the people he's infected can also infect others. And that is uh -huh. why if you recollect, last week there was a strong move for all the meat processing plants in the United States to close because yeah. there was a meat, yes, there was a meat processing plant in South Dakota mm -hmm. and Iowa, Indiana, all these places were experiencing outbreaks. And it was nothing to do with maybe the fish factory in Tema or the meat that is being produced. It's just the sheer fact that you have a large number of people interacting closely with each other and staying in each other's environment for an extended period of time. Mm. 
Okay. And Doc, if you can hear us, maybe you can turn off your video. Um, so we rely on just audio. I think that's the pressure on the data is probably what is giving us this feedback as well. And so I hope she can hear me. But again, explaining to us how the infection at the fish factory may have occurred. Question is, have we started contact tracing yet? And uh, upon investigation, what, what's going to happen now? Um, so, yeah, Dr. Betha is an infectious disease specialist. And th if this is your first time tuning in to COVID-19 360, she joins us every morning to educate us more on it. Doc, you can decide to turn off your video. Um, I, I think today we're having a bit okay. of a challenge. Oh, oh I, can, I can also use another system to see if that would help. Okay, but go ahead. Anyway, I didn't hear your question. I think you had asked me something. I'm not sure what. Well, well, it was the same thing. And the question was that, okay, so does it mean that they really could have gotten it from just that one person directly? And if investigation is done, if tests are conducted, can they trace it all back to that one person? Yes. Um, either that one person or they infected others who infected others. Okay. But the point I was saying, the reason why it makes it more likely that one person can do all that is that there's a five to 14 day incubation period. And, and during that time, I mean, theoretically, those people can transmit disease too. But yes, it's not uncommon to trace all infections to one person. I mean, think of the outbreak itself. It probably started with one person mm -hmm. who spread it to a few people, who spread it to a few people. Of course, the bigger there are not, the faster an infection will spread in a community. Mm -hmm. The R not for this particular infection is thought to be three. But you remember a few issues, you know, a few episodes back, I told you that in Ghana, or in actually not just in any environment where people are close together, your r not could easily be 50 because there are not. Ooh. Okay. All right, so that's Dr. Bertha Sewayi. But send us your questions. Uh, we'll be reading some of them. Hopefully, if the network is favorable, we'll be able to get Dr. Bertha Sewayi to answer. We're hoping to get Dr. Newman Arthur to also join and give us some advice, uh, psychological advice, if possible. I'm not sure if that could happen, um, but we'll still try and get in touch with them. Doc, please carry on. Okay, so I'm saying that in the U.S., they're investigating a teenage party where some teenagers went to a party, and it, I won't be surprised if it's, again, one person. And the R not of three, I think it refers to your normal daily routine where you're going about your work and not have a crowd of people around you. But mm -hmm. if you have people around, so somewhere in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, there was a Smithfield processing plant where one person, well, they didn't say one person, but the infection went from 100 to 300 within two days. You know, again, yeah. I'm sure is that one person who entered the factory and transmitted it to all those people. All right, Doc, uh, just in this case, so if these factory workers live in the factory and have not had any contact with the outside world, but they are working on processing the fish, probably canning it, now could the virus then be transferred to the community from the work that they've done? Maybe could it live on the cans? Uh, let's say a wholesaler comes for it, gives it to a retailer. Could we see a possible uh, spread of the virus from that? Well, I'm assuming that all these workers wear gloves, and so the transmission on all these surfaces is, is not very efficient. Okay. Um, secondly, you know, on surfaces, if it's not inside a human being, it will only live for about 14 days and die. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that they package their food, their, their products, and leave it out there for a while mm -hmm. before they send it out into the community. My concern, though, when I... Okay, um, I guess we'll just wait a bit for the network um, to come back so that we can hear from her because this part is very important. That was my fear, and I'm not sure if that was your fear as well, but hopefully there would be some hope there as to as not getting more people infected from these factory workers. That's if they did not go back home after every day at the factory dock. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you, Doc. Oh, okay. Sorry, I missed the question completely. There was a period where I couldn't hear. You. No, it was the same thing. You were you were talking about um, you know them not possibly infecting people and the virus only um, you know uh, staying alive on surfaces for fourteen days or so. Right, right. But I was saying that my concern is not so much the product. I don't think it would thrive so much on the product versus their families.
Mm. If they don't live at this factory, and in Ghana, I haven't heard of a factory where people live there, but if they go home, the concern is that 500 homes have been infected mm -hmm. with their wives and children or their husbands and children and whatnot. I think that's more of a concern to me than the food products. Okay. Okay. So if that's the case, then contact tracing, we're hoping, should start as soon as possible. Exactly. I'm sure, based on how they've been very efficient with contact tracing, I'm sure they've started because I thought I heard something about the fact that this was an outbreak that happened in April and yeah. that the tests were from a backlog. Mm -hmm. So maybe they've started already. Okay. I'm hoping. Now, now let's talk about the recovery rate and the death rate in the country. Our death rate is very low as against our recovery rate. Now, when you look at the stats, our recovery rate is one of the lowest in Africa. And the question has been that what are we not doing right to get more people to recover, um, you know, as quickly as possible? Would you be able to speak to that for us? Yeah. Okay. Another challenge there, but uh, we'll, we'll just hold on a few minutes and please bear with us. We're having challenges with our connection today, but that's Dr. Betha Sewa Ayi. And so let me give you some facts on that just so that you can also stay with us on these updates as well. Okay, there she is. Okay, Doc. All right. So I was saying that the recovery rate, it depends on what they're using to measure the recovery rate. In some places like the United Kingdom, some people don't even check to see whether the virus is cleared from the throat. Mm. I mean, you have UK nurses who've been ill for just one week and they're told to just go back to work. And they're not checking whether the people are still infected. You know, they just say go back to work. In the United States, where they're checking for all these throat swabs, but they're limited to those who are going back to a nursing home. And that practice is kind of a little unsafe because we now know that there are people whose throat swab stays positive for up to 40 days. So mm -hmm. if you don't check this throat swab and you let people go back and they go back to mix because they think you've told them they recovered and they're still testing positive, then that's a problem. So I'm not sure if the measurement of the recovery rate is based on just clinical recovery, meaning you feel better, or it's based on using the test. If it's using the test, then it might appear to be um, a low recovery rate, but theoretically the people have improved. We're just looking at the swab, which if, if that's what we're looking at, it is the right way to go about it. People may be reporting good recovery rates just based on the fact that, that the patients are feeling better. In that case, Ghana may be, ha may be having a pseudo or falsely low recovery Hmm. Okay. Um... Well, I, I think that at this point, we may have to end this conversation with Dr. Betha Sewa, unfortunately. And so if you send your messages, we'll see if we can forward it. Or hopefully tomorrow, we can address some of your issues. But this is COVID-19 360. We'll be back. All right, welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. You've been sending in your messages, and I'll be taking that in a bit. This one from Don Tona Madrista says, Please, Bella, we're seriously dealing with uh, the coronavirus, but we shouldn't forget that the people in Upper West are dying from cerebrospinal meningitis. The region has recorded 30 more cases in the past two weeks with 44 fatalities. Okay. Hello, I'm Daryl inside Sunyani. You guys look amazing today. Thank you. The extension on the or ban on social gatherings by the president will cause more increase in the cases. People in Sunyani do not adhere to the precautions by the government, especially the wearing of the nose mask. Okay. For the factory workers, we don't know the line of duties of those affected, whether they are directly linked to the product or not. This is from Elvis in Tema. Well, Elvis comes back again and says, Good morning, host. The only thing that can break the chain of spreading is a change in behavior of the population. Else, not even a magic can stop it. Hmm. Elvis, <laughs> we have to be positive around this time. So uh, this one says, so how come the number is increasing? Me like this, I'm okay. My families are okay. And then the president of Ghana is also okay. And moreover, to you that you're reading this to, you are okay and your families too are okay. So who has the COVID-19? Really? <laughs> okay, I have a fair idea on how the virus spreads and its effect on the human system. Looking at the assumed projections, the government must quickly go in contracts deploying more health workers and train them 
to before things get worse. Doctor to patient ratio in Ghana is extremely low. The disease is here and let's find radical solutions to it. This is from Benjamin in Insanwim. Okay. Hi, good morning. I want to ask Dr. Bertha why we keep losing our frontline health workers to this COVID-19 pandemic, especially in Africa. Is it that our biosafety level three labs are not well established or it may be something else. This is Pope Benedict in Tadi, okay? Good morning, and if indeed uh, the test kits truly work, then I suggest every citizen needs to be given to conduct their own test and report the results themselves, mm -hmm. rather than this contact tracing and it's hula baloo. Well, that is if only if someone tests positive, they will be even willing to come forward and say, I did a test and it was positive. Um, hmm, that won't be the best, I think. Hello, you want to have an isolation center where victims who are affected can easily escape. Are we safe? No security protocols to ensure victims from leaving without noticing them. When one person escapes, just imagine the harm caused. Okay. Good morning, Bella and Anita. I always listen to your program and kudos to you all for the good work you continue to do. Thank you. Please, the politicians must embark on house-to-house -house testing with a health tracking team. This is the only way we can curb and stop the spread. I'm Jifa from Teshinungwa Estate. But why should the politicians be part of the uh, contact tracing team? Okay. This is Benjamin from Takrade. Please, I wanted to know if there's an isolation center in Takrade. Well, we'll find out and let you know. Um, we have one of the lowest recovery rates because the patients are refusing to eat dawadawa, kuntumri, crab, and okro. Oh, really? <laughs> well, yesterday the president <laughs> made mention of the fact that we have to be eating dawa dawa okra yeah. and stuff. And social media, especially Twitter, has been awash with uh, memes and stuff of people saying that, okay, you have to eat this, you have to eat that. We're getting yes, really. Well, maybe we should How focus on the this a lot more. I mean, yeah. some contemporary this uh, morning or after won't be a bad idea, maybe. I know. Invite us over, maybe if you have something like that. Yeah. Maybe something with, um, what do you call it, ampeci? Um, ampeci and egg and boom, pear. You know. Oh, I'm well, hungry. In our immune system. <laughs> okay, this one says the instrument and data used to determine the peak of the virus has been infected by the virus. That is you being quite sarcastic. <laughs> well, it is difficult for developed countries to do contact tracing. Most people feel it has given government control over their freedom. Good morning from Marcia. Okay, good morning, Bella and Anita. Bella, you don't look... Oh, really? No, she looks perfectly fine. Look fine. <laughs> she looks very fine. I honestly want to know if the lockdown will be safe to do because most people don't believe the virus is real and what the government is doing about it by letting people know this is not a joke. Okay. Good morning, Bella and Anita. Thanks for the good works for Mother Ghana. Bless you. Bella, can I have your number? This is from Ima inside Medina. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. I think this is also for New Day. Oh, okay. Well, Let's see. Good morning. This, yeah. uh, the extension of the lockdown was in the best interest of the nation. Those who criticize the government for the good decisions only do that to be relevant and for its political survival. President Akufuado really needs to think of the nation. Okay. Well, he is. Good morning. Okay, this is for New Day. New Day okay, yeah, so you can still send in your messages and then we'll be reading all of that right here. What are your grievances? What do you think uh, our authorities or government should be doing? Yes, they are listening to you. So what works for you and what will work for the whole nation is what they are looking at. And so this is COVID-19 360. We're still here all through to 11.30. And Bella? Yes, we are. And still having conversations about the virus. And so uh, there's a lot that you need to know. And I got a message from a friend in Obuasi who says that He's actually very scared to step out because of the rate of infections. And so we should touch again on the need for people to adhere to the precautionary measures because that's the only way they can help spread, uh, stop the spread of the virus. And it's not just people in Obuasi, it's all across. This has ravaged the entire globe. And we hope that as you're watching us, you remember to always wash your hands with soap and running water. Use your sanitizer if you don't have access to water and soap. And also make sure that you have your uh, nose mask on or at least keep a fair distance between yourself and the next person. As, as wide as a Anita and I, um, it's important, two meters or more. We'll be going on Skype in a bit to speak to um, a few other people as well. There's one person in the U.S. who will be giving us updates on what's happening in New York now. A number of countries have started easing their restrictions, and so they're allowing factory workers to go um, do some work and a few other things as well. And so we'll be getting to that shortly. But I think I have uh, Dr. Kwame 
Sapong Asiedu. Uh, okay, this is Nanado, pardon me, and he is in New York right now. Good morning, Nanado. I got your name wrong, pardon me. How are you? Nanado. Hello, Nanado, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good can morning, you how are you doing? I'm doing well, by God's grace. All right, and uh, I know you're keeping safe as well. I mean, New York is the epicenter for coronavirus in the United States. It's quite scary uh, seeing the numbers and looking at what is happening in New York as well. But, but give us an update as of today. What's been happening? Nanado, can you hear me? Hello, Nanado. Okay. All right, anyway, we'll, we'll try and reach him later. But the raging spread of the coronavirus and the global economic fallout from uh, measures to contain it have created a gaping demand for a cure. Although no proven cure has emerged, the Center for Plant Medicine Research says it has received more than 100 samples of traditional herbal medication to be tested for COVID-19 treatments. Now, Portia Gabor explores if traditional herbal practitioners hold the key to finding a cure. Traditional herbal medicine no doubt plays a vital healthcare role in many communities in Africa. According to the World Health Organization, some 70% of patients in Ghana use herbal medicine. The neem tree, hibiscus tea, popularly referred to as sobolo, moringa, among other herbal remedies, have been used by many to cure different types of ailments. Despite this, it has received low consideration from medical experts, demanding more scientific evidence, especially with the outbreak of coronavirus. News of Madagascar developing its own herbal treatment for COVID-19 has been received with skepticism. Aren't there any known herbal remedies to fight COVID-19? Can traditional herbal medicine fight the virus? And what is Ghana's own contribution towards finding a treatment for COVID-19? These questions led me to seek answers at the Center for Plant Medicine Research at Mampong Ikuyapim in the Eastern Region. Long before Orthodox medicine, our forefathers used to take herbal products to cure and treat different forms of ailments. As the world races to find a cure for COVID-19, who knows, treatments could come from here at the Center for Plant Medicine Research. The Center for Plant Medicine Research was established in 1975 as a result of the dream and vision of Dr. Okwampofo, a renowned allopathic medical practitioner. The center's vision is to make herbal medicine a natural choice for all. So what has been the center's contribution in finding treatments for COVID-19? The president said we should get a treatment for the COVID-19. So because of that, we also decided to do our research into these areas. And um, we have done that. Our team of researchers have been on it. And what we are looking at is to make sure that we have treatment for dealing with the symptoms that um, the COVID-19 um, um, comes up with. And also making sure that um, we will see how we can boost the immune system because we know that when you have COVID-19, your immune system becomes weaker. And we know with a strong immune system, you are able to withstand it and then you get healthier. The pandemic has revealed some of the weaknesses in our healthcare system. So we are also looking at making sure that we build our capacity. At the center, all submitted herbal products go through detailed and thorough laboratory analysis to ensure that the products meet the highest quality and safety standards and that they are wholesome for human consumption. Research takes um, some time and we want to make sure that the type of product that we come out is something that is good. Remember that we want to gain the highest recognition. And we do that in partnership with other people. And one thing that I would like to draw your attention is that before any herbal product can be manufactured and sold, you have to get approval from the Food and Drug Authority. So whatever we are doing, we are collaborating with them to ensure that what we bring out is something that will be acceptable. We have over 100 products that have been brought here for testing. 
and when you bring your products here for testing it has to go through some processes first if we want to find out about the safety of it and we take it to our pharmacology uh, you know de um, department we have to make sure that you know there are some i mean analysis that will be done that will involve let's say we have some animals that we use so if you have a lot of products coming at the same time we will be stretched in terms of what we have to do so here, that is when it comes in. So we just want to make sure that we will be in a position to scale up our production. These herbal products here in the laboratory could be possible remedies for COVID-19. And they also have another batch of products, purposely for the COVID uh, management or treatment, uh, received from various herbalists. In fact, we have received over 100 of such products. We're working on them batch by batch. And some of them are promising, some of them too are not too good. We are not done with all the 100 years, but I have looked at about 50 something, and then we have around 10% doing well, mm -hmm. which is even enough. Even if you get one, it's good. Uh, they are showing antibacterial activity, they are showing very strong other antimicrobial activity. So we have to move on to the next level using the other viruses or the same SARS virus. Or after this stage, we write a report, give it to the person or plant or the manufacturer, and it sends to the FDA. The FDA will consider it and give the appropriate certificate for it. Other products, though, do not make the mark. So you can see, each one is one bacterium or one organ that has multiplied several to form this colony, and which work this is what we call the colony forming unit. Now this is what we will count. So you can say she's counting them. And sometimes they are too much that they form a smear or they form together. So we we'll count this. And we we'll estimate how many they are. If the count is more than, per the dilution that we did, if it's more than uh, 50,000 of this in a meal, then we say that it has not passed, it has failed. The centre is also engaging other stakeholders and partners to explore research opportunities in the fight against COVID-19 using herbal medication. Hopefully, with further clinical trials, Ghana's herbal medicine will make news as possible cure or treatment for COVID-19. Porsche Gabo, TV3 News, Mampong Mekuyapim, Eastern Region. And that was a beautiful report by Portia Gabo. Now the Kintampo Health Research Center will in the near future start testing suspected cases of COVID-19 following urgent attention to acquire a qPCR testing machine. The move will expedite the testing of suspected cases in the middle belt. The Bono Regional Director of the Ghana Health Service noted the urgent need to equip the research center with a qPCR testing machine due to the breakdown of a genes expert machine that needed to be recalibrated. Following the recording of the first positive coronavirus case in the region, Dr. Issa said the health directorate has stepped up contact tracing in the field to take samples from identified primary contacts for quarantine. We would have to make sure that we take all those who were in contact with the fellow within two days prior to the day of isolation. So that means that we'll go back almost two days to be able to pick up all these people now that is what we have done he added high surveillance is being mounted in all the 12 districts of the region to gain a broader picture of the infection for appropriate response he reminded the public to continue to adhere to safety protocols to lessen the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the economy and social life According to the Bono Regional Health Director, the confirmed case is a 27-year-old Tukulese national who is among 10 other people who illegally crossed into Ghana from Ivory Coast. The remaining nine migrants have been handed over to the national security for prosecution. You're welcome back. And um, of course, we're still here on uh, COVID-19 
360. Now, since the ad outbreak of COVID-19, the spotlight has been on constant testing, tracing, and treatment across the world. Now, here in Ghana, the Noguchi Memorial Institute is leading testing facility. And so, uh, what goes into testing? Grace Hamo Asare has been finding out. This is the Noguchi Memorial Institute, the facility which has become the leader when it comes to testing for COVID-19 samples here in Ghana. Let's get inside and speak with Dr. Kofi Boni on what this means to the institute as well as speed when it comes to the work they do and people who are even looking forward to the results coming in time. The Noguchi Research Institute receives between 2,500 and 3,000 COVID samples daily. Staff here operate day and night shifts to meet timelines. Dr. Kofiboni, a senior research fellow at the Institute, tells me the first stage samples go through is a login. Any sample that comes in for COVID testing will first come in here. Somebody will log in into this de uh, the details of the sample into these books. Then if it has to go to the lab for them to do the testing, another person will come and as he take the samples out, we'll make sure that it is recorded in this book. The samples are then taken to the lab for sorting, identification and other scientific processes. The process of testing then begins at the Biosafety Level 3 lab. What they do there is basically opening up these bottles there. They also open it up in what is called the Biosafety Cabinet, these cabinets. But then when they go there, they dress fully gowned mm. with the face mask and everything. Because they are going to open these bottles, which we don't know what is inside. Yeah. Uh -huh. So after counting and thing, doing everything here, it goes there. The use of polymerase chain reaction PCR method means a sample can last between two and six hours for real-time results to be produced. If there is no amplification in the sample, it will be a straight line down there. So the straight lines we are seeing down here, they are all samples. But there was no amplification in the sample. In other words, the virus was not in there. Mm -hmm. The ones that we had the virus in there, it will amplify and the amplification will be shown by a curve like that, a curve that looks like an S shape. Mm -hmm. That shows that there is there's enough amplification. The virus, the nucleic acid that was extracted, it has been able to amplify by the machine. So the results are then communicated to the Ghana Health Service and the district health officers who then communicate to patients. Currently, 4,012 people have tested positive for COVID-19. Well, it may seem like a very simple process, but without going through this, one is not sure of his or her COVID-19 status. Grace Hamwa Asari, TV3 News, Noguchi, Accra. Well, and on that note, we'll wrap up uh, an early wrap up for today's show, having a bit of challenges with our uh, uh, network. And so we're unable to speak to all our guests that have been lined up parting us. We'll be back tomorrow with some more. But it's been COVID-19 360. My name is Bella Mundi. And my name is Anita Ikiakufu. Don't forget to be eating your dawa dawa, your okro, your contumery, and your crabs, just as the president mentioned yesterday. And keep staying safe, wear your masks, and also uh, adhere to all the social distancing protocols. And this is COVID-19 360. We'll be back tomorrow. Stay safe.